You know, in the U.S., we have a uh, $100 bill. That's our largest denomination. When I was a teenager, the U.S. had a $500 bill, and they were in circulation. You could you could get them. Um, so they eliminated that in 1968. No more $500 bill. And from then on, the $100 bill was the largest denomination. But the difference between then and now is that 1968 $100 bill was worth $100. Um, if you adjust for inflation, the $100 bill of 1968 is worth about $20 in purchasing power in today's money. So we're already at a point where our largest denomination is worth 20 bucks in purchasing power, at least compared to the 60s, you know, $100 nominally, but, but you know, it's greatly shrunk. So we don't have much cash. By the way, um, if you want a million dollars in $100 bills, it weighs exactly 22 pounds and it fits in an attache case, million dollars in $100 bills. People look at me funny, they go, Jim, how come you know that? Uh, well, <laughs> first of all, I do know that, but it's really just a math problem because one bill, whether it's a one or a hundred, but I'm using hundreds because the biggest weighs a gram. So, you know, it's, so it's basically uh, you know, t- 10 grams or uh, uh, sorry, 10, 10 kilograms, 10 kilos or 22.2 pounds. The point, but we're very far down the road to get them into cash anyway, but you can still do it. You can get your 22 pounds and have your million dollars in cash. So. Why do why are they so driven to eliminate cash? What's they got to do with central bank digital currency? Well, now we get into the purpose of the central bank digital currency. And the, the metaphor I've used is that if you want to slaughter pigs, you have to get all the pigs into a cattle chute and run them into the slaughterhouse and then slaughter, slaughter them. You can't just let them, uh, you know, run around. Uh, you got to herd them up and get them into a cattle chute uh, or cows uh, for that matter. Um, and so if they want to slaughter savers and investors, they have to get you into a digital slaughterhouse. And that, that's what digital money is all about. If you can't have cash and you can only have the central bank digital currency, then everyone's got to have a digital account. And once they've got you in the system, of course, they know who you are because it's all digital and they keep the ledger back to the ledger. What can they do? Uh, well, they can uh, impose negative interest rates. Uh, you know, so you have $100,000 at 1% interest, you go away for a year, you come back, you should have $101,000. But with a negative interest rate of 1%, you go away, come back in a year, and you'd have $99,000. Well, cash is an easy way around that. At least you, know, you can bury it in your backyard, but at least you'd have the uh, uh, the $100,000, in my example, um, a year later. But with, with, uh, with a digital account, they can actually take it out of your account, number one. Number two, they can put um, a timestamp or an expiration date on your money and say, okay, here's your money that's in your account. But if you don't spend 10% of it in the next 30 days, we're going to impose a, you know, 2% penalty. We're going to take it away, basically, if you don't spend it. Oh, what does that do? It kind of forces you to spend it. Is that a kind of stimulus? Um, maybe. I'm not sure. These things don't usually work out as the egghead's plan, but the idea would be, uh, if we don't have enough what Keynes called aggregate demand, we'll force people to go buy stuff by telling them if you don't spend it, you lose it, use it or lose it kind of thing. Okay, uh, withholding taxes. Uh, now, again, in the United States, I think it's similar in Australia. If you have a, a, a job, quote unquote, you know, your regular payday or whatever, they pay you, but they deduct the withholding tax at the source and it's based on the rate. So maybe it's, I don't know, 20%. So you make, uh, thousand dollars they take out two hundred dollars and here's the 800 net to you and then at the end of the year they give you a statement and you file your tax return and you claim withholding and you reconcile your taxes but that's not true for uh independent contractors doctors lawyers professionals writers uh anyone who's who you know you earn a living you work right but um but you don't have any withholding tax but you still have the money still goes in your bank account. Well, now they can just impose the tax on your bank account. Say, well, hey, we see your inflows here. You, you know, you make a nice living. We're going to take 20% of that. Again, send your receipt, tax receipt, and file your tax return and sort it out at the end of the year. Uh, that would come as a shock to a lot of doctors and lawyers. So, uh, so negative interest rates um, and withholding taxes are two things that are hard to impose if in a world of cash and non-central bank digital currencies, but they're easy in a world of no cash and central bank digital currencies. Uh, well, it gets worse. Uh, this is the culmination, just kind of cut to the chase. This is the culmination of the total surveillance state. 
We already have facial recognition software, very good. It's like your face is like a fingerprint. Everyone's a little different. Um, you say, well, that's okay. I'm going to put a mask on because you know, COVID and uh, sunglasses and pull a hat down to my um, down my forehead. You'll never see my face. You know what? They have gait recognition software, G-A-I-T, meaning how you walk. Everybody walks differently. It was it all the was it the Monty Python thing, the mystery of silly walks? Well, silly or not, everybody walks differently. And so they can actually digitally identify you just by the way you walk. Um, and so your mask isn't going to help you. And, and you know, with GPS, uh, I have a bunch of what are called Faraday sacks. They're, um, uh, you know, some of them are nice, I'm glad they're wallets, but they're basically lined with a certain metallic fibers that block radiation. So um, if you want to turn your cell phone off, put it in a Faraday sack. And by the way, do the same with your EasyPass and any other uh, things sending out you know, radiation, uh, which are ubiquitous. Um, maybe they can't follow you around, but most people don't do that and, and they do. And so with your, your iPhone, um, they know where you are at all times. So you, you may be looking at a map trying to find a good restaurant, but they're tracking you. So they already do that. Um, but now they get, take a step further. So you're at the point of purchase, you're buying a book. Let's say it's uh, a book that uh, criticizes Kevin Rudd, for example, he's your leading uh, panda hugger down in Australia or in the United States criticizes uh, Joe Biden uh, or something, or, you know, ultra MAGA uh, hamburger, whatever it is. Well, oh gee, ultra MAGA, you're a, uh, you're an extremist, you're a radical, you're part of the insurrection. Uh, so now we're going to freeze your account or deny the purchase or put you on a watch list or one of our, we just appropriated money to hire 87,000 armed uh, IRS and general revenue service agents. Maybe we'll sign one to you because you bought the wrong book. So now we're into thought control. Uh, we're into um, basically subduing your political enemies because you know uh, you know, well, if you give money to a certain candidate, political candidate, again, perfectly legal stuff, buy a book, make a donation, that's legal, but they don't like who you're doing it with. And they're, they, meaning the government, and they're watching, they know what you're reading and, and by inference, what you're thinking, who you're giving money to, what causes you support, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't take much these days to have some, you know, kind of low IQ spokesperson at the White House label you as an extremist. So this is all, um, this is all government's ever wanted. It was total control of the people. You know, it makes Louis the Fourteenth look like a, uh, a very hands-off kind of guy. But Jim, but, Jim but, the, the government yeah. would never do these things. That you know, the tax office would never target you know, a political group. You know, they would never target a group of people because of donations to, to different causes. They would never target protesters in any way. They would never target someone who's a, you know, doesn't want to get vaccinated in any way. None of these things would ever happen. <laughs> well, uh, I know you're. I know you're being uh, uh, actually very serious, but uh, I, I know that's more rhetorical. The fact is, not only will they happen, they have happened. They are happening. This is the world we live in. That's absolutely the case. And let me give some concrete examples because I don't put stuff like that out there without backing up. So in 2010, the IRS targeted what we called the United States the Tea Party movement. This was the first midterm of President Obama's first term in office. Historically, a time when the uh, president's party loses a lot of seats. It just, it's not even Democrats versus Republicans. It's just a consistent pattern of first term president, first midterm election, they lose seats. Obama lost like, almost a record number of seats, something like 63 or 64 seats versus an historical average uh, closer to 30. Because of uh, people were upset about Obamacare, they were upset about the tax increases, uh, the bailouts coming out of the 2008 global financial crisis favored the rich, hurt the poor. There was just a lot of, and a lot of people were having second thoughts about voting for Obama in the first place. So we, we had this Tea Party movement, and they just kicked butt in the 2010 election. Well, so these were springing up everywhere. This was a, a genuine grassroots movement. This, there was no like nationwide top-down organization. Communities were like, hey, let's start our own branch of the Tea Party, et cetera. And because they were, they qualified as nonprofit organizations, there's some rules around that, but but you have to apply to the IRS, our Internal Revenue Service, for uh, a designation and a number proving that you're a, a, a nonprofit organization. Well, 
the person in charge of those was slow rolling all the applications. They weren't getting approved. They were entitled to it. That the IRS intervened to squash the formation of Tea Party movements from coast to coast um, for political reasons, plain and simple. Well, that was 12 years ago, and there was no central bank digital currency. Imagine how much more powerful that kind of corruption is today. People hear the government say, you know, the economy's fine, or you know, unemployment's near an all-time low, you know, which actually statistically is is true, and they they kind of nod and go, yeah, it's all good, and then. Reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four. You know, the propaganda is um, positive. We can talk about that in a little more detail. The reality is harsh um, and reality wins. Um, and there's a very good book um, on this um, by Robert Schiller, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. I'm not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there and he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less called Narrative Economics. Uh, he said, yeah, we got all the models and uh, Phillips curve and uh, wealth effect and uh, uh, you know various you know quantity theory of money. And you know some have a place, some are more valuable than others. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just to something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out or reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. And he gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, uh, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was another period from 1933 to 1937. The 37 and 1940 part we leave aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time, but it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job, I've got some money, but I'm not gonna buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are, have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because is precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of a depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, the psychology turned 180 degrees and all of a sudden, you know, the the Democratic campaign saw always happy days are here again, and you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth. And all of a sudden it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still you know painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flip from don't spend money, it's poor form to, yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly, but they'll say, 
if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some I know some of these people. It's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low. Um, it, it's we've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, you And this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything, was great until February 27th, and then Russia invades, and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. Um, so it predates the war, number one. Number two, oh, gee, energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine, it's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. Then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, et cetera, to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120 in, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said they shut it down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021, and then Biden came in, we lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the US has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another, fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got to, we don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are pow powerful, but reality is more powerful. There were a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages. These are mortgages that, you know, no documentation, don't have to prove your income, very non-credit worthy. But there was a there was a bubble mentality, a frenzy, and everyone, hey, buy a house and borrow money, fix it up, sell it for twice as much, walk away rich, you know, and everybody was doing it. Mortgage default rates rarely get above 5%. 5% is really high in the mortgage market. 
So people were saying, you know, smart people like Ben Stein, the financial analyst, but, but the central bank and others were like, well, okay, let's get crazy. Let's assume a 20% default rate, which, is, which ne has never happened, but just assume that's true. On a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages, a 20% default rate would be a $200 billion loss, which was only slightly higher than the SNL crisis of the 1980s. You know, adjusted for inflation, it would have been a comparable loss. And the attitude was, well, we survived the 80s, we'll survive this. Yeah, it's bad, banks will take losses, stock prices go down a little bit, but we'll survive. What they missed is, yes, there was $1 trillion of uh, subprime mortgages, but there were $6 trillion of derivatives. Yeah. That was invisible. So all of a sudden, 20% of that was $1.2 So you, you create derivatives out of thin air, yeah. Uh, and there's no limit on how many you can have. They're off balance sheet, meaning give me the balance sheet of the company, I won't see them. You have to read the footnotes and then the, the information behind the footnotes. So non-transparent, unregulated, no limit on size. So the, the crisis was actually much worse than anyone realized. And then when it started to collapse, the, the, the contagion spread throughout the financial system. My point about 2008, it was because we did not learn the lessons of 1998 and we flew right into 2008. But once again, we have not learned the lessons of 2008, and we're gonna fly right into the next storm. In 1998, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. Who's gonna bail out the central banks? In other words, the point is each crisis is bigger than the one before. The uh, intervention gets elevated, larger dollar amounts. And are we now at the point where there's no one left to bail us out? And uh, one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, okay, Jim, I kind of follow your analysis on how risk works and how com complexity theory is and capital markets, how that works, but where's the crisis coming from? What's going to be the catalyst? It's actually a long list. Now, student loans, there are $1.6 trillion worth of student loans. So this will go, and kind of this gets to your point, Francis, you know, how, does the, how do capital markets and, and money markets and Fed policy kind of leach into to debt and deficits? Uh, so when um, you know a lender, credit union, or anybody, or university makes a loan to a student, and the treasury uh, guarantees that loan, which they do, it's off budget. Uh, again, it's 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 not strictly a derivative, but it is non-transparent. So then the student defaults, um, and the credit union, the lender, simply turns to the treasury and said, "Here's here's your loan file, pay me." And the treasury pays the lender because they've guaranteed the loan. Uh, now it's on the treasury, but until that point, that loss is not on the books of the United States government. That loss is not part of the deficit. But when the treasury writes the check to make good on the guarantee, it does go into the deficit. So we think deficits are high now, but there's this you know trillion dollar tsunami of student loan losses that's going to pile on top of the structural deficits and make it even worse. So all these things are, you know, I'm, I spend all my time analyzing these things. I see them all, I can describe them. I can see how they're gonna converge into, into a worse crisis. But in the short run, people either ignore them or they just don't know anything about them. Why, but why would Bernie Sanders even suggest that? And by the way, he's not alone. I think the other candidates of, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, one way or another, have suggested that they would do something similar, that we need student loan relief, and that ends up going onto the budget and, and onto the taxpayers. Uh, but there's a school of economics, and I talk about this in, uh, um, in chapter five of my book. Um, it's called Modern Monetary Theory, uh, MMT for short. Everyday viewers, everyday people to know anything about it, but more to the point, economists don't know anything about it. This is a new school of economics, if you want to think of it that way. So there is this modern monetary theory, but the leading scholar of modern monetary theory is a lady named Stephanie Kelton, who's a professor at the State University of New York. But she's the financial advisor to Bernie Sanders. What modern monetary theory says is that actually there's no limit on the amount you can spend. You can spend as much as you want, uh, and the market will either buy the debt, or if they balk, the Fed will monetize the debt. So how much debt is there relative to the size of the economy. The, this is called the debt to GDP ratio, but mm. the way it's a simple fraction you learn in the fifth grade. How much debt divided by the size of the economy? So in a simple example, if you had uh, $5 trillion of debt and a $10 trillion economy, that fraction would be one half. So you would mm. say the debt to GDP ratio is one half or 50%.
Today, the debt is larger than the economy. Yeah. That ratio is over 100%. We had round numbers, about $23 trillion of debt and about a $22 trillion economy. So the, the ratio is about 105%, highest since World War II. That troubles me, it troubles other economists. But my friend Stephanie says, what's the problem? You could take it to 150%, 200%. 250%. By the way, that's where Japan is. Japan's at 250%. Greece is uh, 175% or so. Italy's uh, 135%. They're all still standing. If you go to the Ginza, you know, it looks like Times Square. So you don't see visible signs of stress. And, uh, and here's the irony. Ben Bernanke would absolutely not agree with this theory. And he, he said so publicly. But uh, Professor Kelton says to Bernanke, you proved our point. You were the one who took the Fed's balance sheet and quadrupled it from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion or so, you prove that you can print trillions of dollars of money without causing inflation, without causing high interest rates, without causing a run on the bank. So all we're saying is, you know, you did it to prop up Jamie Dimon's bonus. We wanted to do it to forgive student loans. We may have, we may have different policy objectives, but the process is the same. What's the problem? Now, of all the things I've debated, I've, for years I was de dragged into Bitcoin versus gold debates, which I thought were silly. I mean, I don't like Bitcoin, I do like gold, but it's like fish versus bicycles. I mean, the debate never made sense to me, even though I did a lot of them. Uh, of all the things I've had to rebut, this was actually the most difficult because it's superficially appealing. First of all, legally it is true that the Fed can take their balance sheet as high as they want. There's no legal limit on the Fed's ability to print money. Uh, it is true that Japan has a much higher debt to GDP ratio, and they're still standing. Um, it is true that the, the Treasury can borrow as much as they want, subject to periodic increases in the debt ceiling, which have never been uh, denied. Um, and the Fed can monetize the debt. So all the elements of the thesis are actually correct. So how do you refute it? Um, and the, the answer is that legally it can be done. Uh, and if your goal is to print a lot of money and uh, you know, forgive student loans or give a guaranteed job or guaranteed basic income, uh, whatever it is, in theory you could do that. But there is an invisible psychological boundary. And this is what the modern monetary theorists don't understand, and I don't think Ben Bernanke understands it. There comes a time when people wake up and they say, you know, I don't know what's going on here, I don't have a PhD, but get me out of the dollar. Uh, it doesn't, and so, you know, I'll, I'll buy gold, I'll, I'll buy silver, land, oil, natural resources, I'll buy a new car, buy a house, get me out of the dollar into something tangible mm. because I no longer trust the monetary authorities, I no longer trust the Congress, uh, I can't believe that you're going to spend this much money without ceiling, without limit, uh, without causing inflation. My inflationary expectations will go up and the way to deal with that is to buy hard assets, starting with gold, but not exclusively gold, or as I say, land real estate, um, and natural resources, they're all, good, uh, they're all good substitutes. At that point, interest rates will skyrocket. All of a sudden, the bond market will have difficulty selling it. The, the, you know, the president of the Congress could take away some of the Fed's independence. All of these assumptions could come crashing down very quickly, very unexpectedly, and that's the problem with the theory. I would say that the Fed may actually cut rates sooner than sooner than Michael Wilson expects and maybe sooner than a lot of Wall Street expects. Uh, and you say, well, Jim, isn't that good for stocks? And the answer is no, because the reason they're going to cut rates is because things are going to be much worse than even Wilson and others expect, which is going to cause the economy to crash. And then you will pivot, not because you want to, but because inflation might be zero, it could be negative. We, you, we could actually be into deflation. We're already in disinflation. Disinflation is when you still have inflation that's coming down. That's disinflation. It's still coming, you still have inflation, but it's coming down. Deflation is when prices actually go down. In inflation is negative. It's not a question of going up at a slower rate, it's a question of actually going down. Um, and then that feeds on itself. That's a central banker's worst nightmare because people say, why should I buy anything? I'll just, I'll just sit in my money and wait for the price to come down, maybe buy six months from now or maybe wait a year. And then that feeds on itself. And then unemployment goes up, businesses shut down, stock markets crash, you know, et cetera. And the Fed pretty quickly turns around and cuts rates. Now, we've actually seen this movie, uh, and it wasn't that long ago. Go back to uh, 2015. 
December 2015. That was the famous liftoff. Remember, interest rates had been at zero, I believe, for six, six and a half years at that point, the zero interest rate policy. And then Janet Yellen raises interest rates 25 basis points. Okay, it was a baby step, but at least they went up for the first time in six or seven years. And it actually was longer than that because they they were at zero for they were at zero for six years, but there was a series of cuts to get to zero. So the last time they had raised rates was even further back. That was like 2006. So uh, so that was a uh, more like nine years. So she raises interest rates 25 basis points and then waits a year. The next rate hike was December 2016. They waited a whole year just to go 25 basis points more, almost as if they would have been embarrassed if they had done nothing in all of 2016. I think it was the only reason they did it. But then when Powell came in in, in 2017, that tempo picked up. It was like kind of nothing burger for a year and a half. But then Powell's like, boom, 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 you know, 25 basis point hikes and got the rate all the way up to two and a half, which doesn't sound like a lot, but considering that they had been at zero for six years, that was that was pretty steep. But what happened between October 1st and December 24, 2018? The stock market collapsed. I mean, the uh, the Dow Jones, the S&P, uh, and the NASDAQ all fell about 20%, just short of a bear market. It was like 19.8%, you know, 20% to all intents and purposes. But that was in less than three months. And the Fed kept raising rates in the middle of the stock market crash. This shows you how out of touch they are and how behind the curve they are. So the last rate hike was December uh, 14th or 15th. They got to look at the calendar. It was, it was right, right around the middle of December, 14th or 15th. Even after two months of crashing stock prices, they raised rates one last time. They just kept going and kind of what we were, what we were talking about earlier. And then finally on December 24th, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre, the NASDAQ fell 3% in one day. The Dow was like about 1.8%, S&P was over two, and, and the NASDAQ was 3%. And then the, the Fed got religion, like, oh, we went too far. Uh, we're the last to know, as always. So early January, 2019, Powell said, use the word patient, it's one of those code words. It means, patient means we're not gonna raise rates unless we tell you. So they were on pause. And then by late 2019, they cut rates. And then along came COVID, and by March 2020, they were back to zero. You had this huge round trip from zero in November 2015 to about two and a quarter, two and a half in DC 2018, back down to zero by March 2020. Like, what was that all about? Well, the Fed went too far, didn't know what they were doing. The economy was weaker than they expected, and they raised rates. So, so bring that scenario forward to today, I feel like I'm watching the same movie, which is, okay, the feds, they got the gumption, they raise rates, raise rates, raise rates. Now they're much higher than they were in 2018, but they're flying into a hurricane. They're flying into a very weak economy, seen by a lot of metrics, housing stars, global trade, ISM surveys, industrial output, inventories. There's, there's tons of negative data. It's not the kind of thing that people, doesn't make their headlines the way CPI does, but it's all there, it's hard data. So it looks like a bigger, better version of what happened in 2018. And I would expect a worse outcome. So my point is the Fed may in fact rate, sorry, the Fed may in fact cut rates sooner than Wall Street expects, sooner than Michael Wilson expects, but not for good reasons, but for very bad reasons because we're in a severe recession. So, so the bottom line is we've had the supply side inflation. Now, we have not seen it come from the demand side, but let's say you're the Fed, okay? All you wanna do is get inflation under control. You kinda of don't care where it's coming from. You just wanna get it down to 2%. So then the question is, okay, how how is the Fed doing at getting inflation to the target? The, the 2% we talked about, and explain why that's their number. The answer is they're making progress, but they're not there yet. And he's, and this says a lot about what's going on in the stock market right now, because you go all the way back to August 26th, 2022. That was Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. And he said, inflation's, you know, not, he didn't use the word out of control. But he said, inflation's way too high. We're going to bring it down to our 2% target. We know unemployment's going to go up. We know he will probably have recession. He did not use the R word. He didn't say recession, but he said, you know, growth will suffer. Unemployment will go up. That's just a fancy way of saying there's going to be a recession. And we're not going to stop until we get there. And so in other words, too bad, you know, well, the Fed has no tools 
to affect the supply side. The Fed doesn't drive trucks, they don't drill for oil, they don't plant crops, they don't run tractors, they don't do anything that could alleviate the, su the supply side problems. All the Fed can do is destroy demand, and that they can do. When you raise interest rates enough, mortgage rates go up, credit card rates go up, you know, cost of working capital go up, all that tends to slow the economy and it causes people to tighten their belts. But just think of the conundrum. The, the inflation is coming from the supply side. The Fed can't do anything about the supply side, but they can crush demand, which should reduce inflation. But how much do you have to crush demand when that's not the problem? It's coming from the supply side. How much demand do you have to destroy to actually affect the supply side? The answer is a lot. And this is what Jay Powell has been saying. Unemployment has to go up. We're, we're going to be in a recession. We've got to crush this thing before it gets out of control. And you got to crush it even more because that's not even where the inflation is coming from. It's coming from the supply side. Supply chain bottlenecks have been alleviated to some extent, not not completely by any means. And uh, it was always a case of popping up here and there. You know, it's not like you went into a supermarket and all the shelves were bare. It wasn't East Germany in the 1950s, but something would be missing. You know, it could be the peanut butter one day or the, the canned goods the next or spaghetti the week after that. That has uh, alleviated to some extent, not, not completely. But again, the reason it has been alleviated is a very bad one which is that demand is down. In other words, the Fed is destroying demand, so people are buying less. So, you know, grocers and retailers and boutiques and suppliers are able to keep more things on the shelf, not because all the logistics problems have been solved, but because the demand is down, because that's what the Fed's doing. So supply chain better, yes, but for good reasons or bad reasons? Well, it's for bad reasons because demand is down. And that's another thing leading us into a recession.